Yes, Mr. Smith. Um, may it please uh, your lordships, I appear together with Mr. Alatar, the appellants. Um, the appellants are various investors in certain debt issued by the Adler Group called 2029 Sons. Um, my learned friends, Mr. Bayfield, Mr. Perkins, and Ms. Wang appear for the respondent, AGPS Bond Co. PLC. Um, that is the company within the Adler Group that promulgated the restructuring plan, which is the subject of the present appeal. Um, as your lordships will have seen, this is an appeal from the order and judgment of Mr. Justice Leach. Yes, um, you, you can take it that we've read the judgment and the skeletons, um, so we at least have some idea of what it's about. I'm grateful. Um, my lord, uh, the particular issue, as your lordship will have seen, that arises in the present case is the judge um, exercised a new power in the Companies Act called the cross class cram down power. Um, as your lordships will have seen, that was introduced for the first time in 2020 by way of amendments made to the Companies Act. This is the first time um, <coughs> in which that particular power has come before this court. Um, as your Lordships will also have seen, those amendments introduced a new restructuring procedure into the 2020 Act, that's commonly referred to as a restructuring plan. Um, that was a development of the existing well-established scheme of arrangement procedure, and one of the innovations that was carried with that was the introduction of the cross-class cram down power. Um, now, my lords, in short, we say the judge was wrong to exercise the cross-class cram down power in the present case, and that in particular, he applied the wrong legal test for the exercise of that power. Um, and as I'll come to in due course, Amongst other things, we say the judge simply transplanted case law from the existing well-established scheme of arrangement procedure, which your lordships will be very well familiar with, without taking into account properly that a restructuring plan is a different procedure where materially different considerations apply. And I'll come and develop that, that point in due course. Um, now, my lord, so far as the facts of the case are concerned, there are a number of grounds on which we put the appeal. Um, but our core complaint is at heart a simple one. And if I can just outline that um, for your lordship, for giving your, your lordships in, in essence a bird's eye overview of our case. Um, my lords, in the present case, um, very importantly, it was common ground that the alternative to the plan was a liquidation of the plan company and the other relevant companies in the Adler Group. That was common ground. Um, it was also common ground that in that alternative scenario, all of the relevant debt of the plan company and the group would rank for payment pari passu as unsecured claims. When you say relevant debt, you're talking about the sons. Exactly, my yes. lord. There, there is quite a lot of other debt. There's bank debt and the Adler RE has debt which has various priorities, but what we're interested in is the sons. Is exactly, that? and that's the debt for which the, the plan company itself had assumed responsibility. There's other debt elsewhere in the group, including the debt at Adler Re, um, there's other debt um, at Adler, um, the Adler Group SA itself, but the debt we're concerned with is the debt of the plan company, which your lordship is absolutely right, is the sons. Now, um, which was 3.2 billion face value? Um, roughly, it's set out in paragraph 11 of the judgment um, if you out, out of over 6 billion total yes. debt in the group that's right, if, if, there's a quite helpful table I think in paragraph this paragraph 11 and then paragraph 12 of the judgment core bundle 2 pages 760 and 761 um, but there um, the judge conveniently summarises um, the key features of the sums I think if you add that up it comes to 3.2 I think your lordship I think your lordship's right um, now, can I, can I just ask you? Yes, I, I approved the transcript. I assume we are going to get daily transcripts. Your lordship should get a transcript at the end of the day. That saves us from taking a full note. Exactly. Yes. We'll make sure those uh, make their way to your, your lordship's group. Thank you. And, and, and can I ask you one other thing? Have you, Mr. Bayfield, discussed how to divide up the time between you? We have. We're going to split the time equally. I think we we both think three days ought to be ample, and we we look to finish within that time. Um, but we will we will split the time equally. So that means you'll finish not today? or I, I think I will probably go into tomorrow morning, but not by very much. Yeah. I 
get in, and then and the president will take as long as he takes. But I think we think three days will be more than sufficient. Well, you you only have three days. We so do. It has, three to be, days. it has to be sufficient. I know. <laughs> I, what I'm trying to say is, I hope we will finish well within yes. three days. Thank you. Um, now, but just going back to, to where I was, one of the critical features of the present case is, is the common ground that the relevant alternative is liquidation, and that in that relevant alternative, all of the debt your Lordship sees in paragraphs 11 and 12 of the judgment um, would be accelerated and would rank the payment pari passu alongside each other. Now, that's critical because although the debt has different contractual maturity dates, as your Lordship sees, in the relevant alternative, it would all, in effect, have the same maturity date because it would all be accelerated, it would all rank peri passu alongside each other. So in other words, a debt with a maturity date of 2029 would stand in the same position as a debt with a maturity date of 2024. And that's simply a feature of an insolvency process. It's a feature of a German insolvency process as much as it is of an English one. Um, uh, with the same face value, the fact the fact that in the contractual um, situation you wouldn't receive your twenty twenty nine debt for a number of years doesn't lead to a discount on it was the value. Not, it never suggested yeah. that there would be there would be a discount for early yeah. early payment in the insolvency scenario. Um, now, in our submission, that acceleration feature, if I use that terminology, is an entirely standard and unsurprising feature of an insolvency process. It's part of the mechanics by which you achieve a distribution between the creditors. Um, and it's exactly what anyone would expect, including the note holders commercially. Now, what happened in the present case, and we say this is the real mischief about which we make complaint, is that the plan deviated very materially from that position. So instead of treating the different debt pari passu, the plan gives the debt different maturity dates coming out of the plan, ranging from 2024 to 2029. And specifically in our case, our maturity date is 2029. Um, and in addition, the plan also confers security on some of the debt, 2024 notes in particular, but not on the remainder. So we say that's a very material deviation from the pari passu uh, distribution that would apply in the relevant alternative. Um, the effect of that deviation um, is highly material and highly prejudicial to us because instead of being treated in the same way as the other Sun holders, we are given debt which will not become payable until 2029 and which therefore falls for repayment behind all of the other debt which is given early maturity dates. And in effect, rather than ranking alongside, we're put at the end of the queue for payment. We go to the back of the queue instead of ranking alongside equally. Now, there was much debate before the judge as to whether our notes are likely to be paid in 2029 or not under the plan. Um, the reality is um, no one really knows because no one has a crystal ball that enables you to see reliably that far into the future. You only have to look at what's happened in the world in the last six years to realise one doesn't have too much of an idea of what might happen in the next six years and how that might affect the German residential property market and our prospects of being paid in 2029. But the key point is that on any view, as the judge himself accepted, and I'll show you, Lordships, in due course where he accepted this in the judgment, under the plan, our notes are at a materially greater risk of not being paid in the earlier date of death. So, deviation from the pari passu rule, prejudicial to us because we end up carrying a materially greater risk of non payment than the earlier date. Now, my lord, we he made a finding of fact that it was on the balance of probabilities likely that everybody would be paid in full. Did he not? Well, we'll come to we'll come to what he did find. In my submission, he, that's not what he found. Um, what he found was that the most likely 
option of the different options that were put before him, that the, the debt would be paid in full. And that's a, a subtle but important difference. But in any case, whether that's right or wrong, what he did find in our submission correctly was that our debt was at the materially greater risk. Paragraphs 300 and 301 of the judgment. Yes, exactly. Yes, and indeed the critical, uh, my, I'm grateful to my lordship, it's the first sentence of 301 is the critical finding. Well, 300 and 301 read together. Yes, exactly. So we can come to this debate about what in fact the judge found in terms of whether our notes were likely to be paid in full or not. Um, and there is a dispute on that. But my primary submission is actually it doesn't matter because he found that uh, our notes were at materially greater yes. risk of not uh, being paid. I mean, what I was thinking of, look at 298. Yes. It is likely that the plan creditors will be paid in full. That's not just, it's more likely that, that um, Mr. Bayfield's submissions are right than that your submissions are right. But it is, you know, he does make that finding, but I've, I entirely accept that he says, obviously, rightly, that this can't be a guarantee. I don't know. Nobody <coughs> can know. Yeah. And, and there are risks. And your point is, given there are risks, why should the risks fall on you and not anybody else? That's exactly the point. And I mean, I'll come to this point about what, what the judge, in fact, found. And it's, it's, it, it's, it's not easy on the judgment, because you also need to look, for example, at what he, he, he held in 291 to 293. But, and it's, it's a little bit of a sort of complicated debate, but it doesn't matter to my primary point, which is based on the allocation of risk. Now, on the Pari Passu distribution, everyone bears the risk equally. If the value of the assets subsequently deteriorates, everyone bears that risk equally. If the value of the assets goes up, everyone bears in that benefit equally. The real mischief of this plan is it, in effect, puts all the risk on us puts the majority of the risk on us by putting us at the back of the queue. And we're, we're therefore the ones who bear the greatest risk that the assets won't be sufficient to meet the liabilities. But the, if there was a good reason for that, in other words, a good reason for as we're elevating everybody else ahead of you in the queue, then I think it's common ground, as I understand it, that both of you accept that um, a plan could still be sanctioned. Yes. I mean, it's so, paragraph 74 of the judge. Exactly. I mean, we, we rely on, I mean, seven, paragraph 74 reflects our submission, which we made to the judge and which I make to this court as to what the test is. Um, and and so just you're, to, you're not saying that the Parai Passu principle can never be deviated correct. from under a plan. It's You're saying it can be, but there needs to be good reason, whatever that means. That's exactly right. Yep. So, I mean, indeed, this is exactly what I was going to say next, is that we do not say, it's not our submission, that there's an invariable rule that a restructuring plan can never depart from the basic rule of treating unsecured creditors on a pari passive basis. We don't put it like that. What we do say is there must be a good reason and proper justification for any such departure. One such departure might be, for example, where in order to rescue a business as a going concern, you need to pay particular creditors, such as employees, so as to preserve value for the benefit of everyone. But in the present case, as the judge himself found, there was no such good reason or proper justification. And what, what is in very important for your lordships to have in mind, and this, this doesn't in fact come across in, in my submission all that strongly from the judgment, but it's an undisputed fact, all the plan does in the present case is provide the liquidation and wind down of the group. It's a liquidation plan. Now, there's absolutely no reason. Sorry, I, uh, I have a terminological question. Yes. When you say it's a liquidation plan, yes. you don't mean that the plan involves any form of informal insolvency no. process. The idea is <coughs> it will be, the hope is, it will be a solvent restructuring. What do you mean? by saying it's a liquidation plan, is that the aim of the plan is to dispose of all the assets and pay off all the creditors. Exactly. So it's, it's not a case where there's any well, going concerns. Speaking point. personally, I find, I find the terminology liquidation for that slightly confusing because you, one tends to think of liquidation as, as a yes. formal insolvency process. You wind, wind down. down. Wind down. Wind down is a better... Wind down is planned. Wind down as opposed to wind up. Exactly. Yes. I'm grateful. 
my lord. And obviously, the crucial distinction is what wasn't going on here is trying to preserve an ongoing trading business. No, I mean, at the end of the process, all the assets would be sold. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, and that, therefore, the key point is there's absolutely no reason why this couldn't have been achieved whilst respecting the Parry Passage treatment of unsecured debt that would have applied in a liquidation. And indeed, as I'll show you, the company conceded that was the case in cross-examination. It's obviously right. Um, and the reason is you simply um, provide for a liquidation plan, a wind-down plan, that simply says unsecured creditors will share equally in realisations as and when they're made. Well, that's 3027 of the judgment. Yes, I think your lordship... Exactly, exactly, your lordship's exactly right. Now, so overall, we say this was a case where there was simply no good reason for departing from the parry passive distribution that would have applied in a liquidation and in which the appellants would have been treated equally alongside the other unsecured debt. There was no good reason for prejudicing us under the plan. Can, can I just be clear, Mr Smith? Yes. When, when you say you should all have been treated equally in terms of the date on which your debt will be paid, yeah. um, are, are we... It, is your case that that whenever, whatever point in time that was struck, would satisfy the the legal requirements, or that for the Parai Pasu principle properly to be invoked, we'd be looking at around about twenty twenty four? Um, well, I mean, I, I just want to be clear. I mean, are you saying that? The judge should only have approved the plan if everybody, if everybody's payment debt was accelerated. You should only so that it was it was all say in in, in two thousand and twenty four. What he should have done is only approved the plan on the basis that it treated all the sun holders equally yeah. relative to each other, so that as and when there were realizations made under the plan, they shared equally and racefully in those realisations. So the critical point is, relative to each other, they're all treated in the same way. But when that moment comes, might be dictated by other circumstances. It, so indeed, so. and we, we accept it. it we, in practice, it would be dictated by as and when the realisations were made. Because right. we would we accept that one, indeed, this is, was part of our case, one of the ways you could have structured this plan is to have the realisations over time taking place <laughs> to 2029 and saying that the unsecured creditors will share ratably in those realisations as and when they're made and they won't have any other rights of recourse against the company. That would so, so what that actually means is is you, instead of accelerating, <coughs> you, you defer everybody's rights <coughs> to sue um, and in return they get a share in the realisations could, when they're made. I mean, I mean whether it's whether it's a deferral or what I mean, the way I, I, perhaps I would see this is everybody has an accelerated right, but they have limited rights of recourse, yes. and their only recourse is to share ratably in the realisations as and when they're made. In, in a liquidation, everybody's rights are accelerated, but their ability to receive monies in respect of those rights are deferred until the liquidator has the money to make a distribution. Yes. So you're saying what should have happened, to, to use the judge's word, to harmonise the rights of plan creditors <coughs> is that some mechanism perhaps similar to that yes. should have been written into the plan. Yes, exactly. You could have structured it in exactly the same way. Yeah. Well, you know, in a sense, the plan can do whatever yes. the plan does, provided that you say the rights in the relevant alternative, which is a formal liquidation, yes. were the starting point for the the plan, not necessarily the end point, but the starting point exactly. at least, absent some good reason to depart. Exactly. Because I mean we'll come to this, but you have to ask yourself, well, what's what's the reason for doing the restructuring plan as opposed to the formal insolvency? 
the reason for doing it is to avoid the rush to market in the form of insolvency, having to dispose of all the properties very quickly, and therefore leading to an insolvency discount on the disposal, and therefore reducing... But the insolvency discount is not only attributable to the timing, because actually under the plan, the timing of disposals is just as quick. It's, well, it's, it's due to the fact that, that um, administrators, liquidators, won't give covenants, uh, won't, won't give ongoing... Yes. Luck. Um, warranties and so on and there are people who will the market will perceive that it's a distressed sale and so will offer less your logic right so for whatever reason and a lot your logic right in identifying what those reasons are if you do the disposal outside of the formal insolvency proceeding you won't suffer that insolvency discount You'll, you hope you hope you, you hope, hope you won't you, you create what is Term the restructuring. You service. do exactly. You create the, the benefit of doing the restructuring plan vis a vis the formal insolvency, and it's it's that the benefit is in effect avoiding the insolvency discount, which, which you hope to achieve. But you can achieve that objective under the plan by having a staged realization of the assets um, outside of an insolvency. They take place when they take place, and you limit the right of recourse of creditors to realization of that and when they're made. And you treat them all equally in terms of their entitlement to share in those realisations. And that's the way in which it should have been done. The way it could have been done like that, there's no suggestion to the contrary. Um, and there's no good reason for doing it this, this other way that deviates from Perry Passo, puts us at the back of the queue and prejudices us. So that is, I mean, that, that's, we've, we'll just, spend some time going into the ins and outs of this, but I mean, that, that's the crux of. Um, uh, our, our appeal. Just to be clear, it wasn't for the judge to come up with a better plan. No. It, it, it was for him to say whether this one should be approved or not. Exactly. Exactly. But your point is, given that it does depart from the relevant alternative, from the peri passu treatment, some justification has to be put forward, and you say you can't find one. No, there was none before the judge. There still isn't one put to your lordship. I mean, if you look at my lone friend's skeleton argument, there isn't a justification. So, my lord, that we'll, we'll come into some of the, the detail, but I mean, ultimately, the, the points I've just made to um, your lordships are essentially the, the, the crux of our appeal. Um, now, um, just to get one point out of the way before I um, turn to um, look at the law and some of the facts, um, there was originally some suggestion on the part of the respondent that it intended to argue that the appeal should be rejected on the grounds it was nugatory on the basis of the plan had at least to some extent already been implemented. Um, we never accepted that was the case. Um, in any event, that point has been abandoned by the respondents. Um, the court's order of the 29th of June required that if the respondent was to make any such contention, it filed supporting evidence to make that good. Um, no such evidence has been filed by the respondent, and it now says in paragraph 10 of its skeleton argument that it accepts that this point does not mean that the appeal must be dismissed. No, but I think we would like to understand what the current position is and yes. what you say, and indeed what Mr Bayfield says, we should be doing yes. if we think the judge's decision is flawed. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll come, I can address both of those points. I'll, I'll come to that if um, I may. Yes, not necessarily now, but, but, but... Towards the end of my submission. Um, so, my, my Lord, what I was going to do, um, if it's convenient to your Lordship, before turning to the, the grounds of appeal, um, I just wanted to spend a little time on, on the law, if I, I may, in relation to schemes and restructuring plans. Um, and then, secondly, just deal with the facts of the case, because ultimately the facts of the case are, are extremely important, and those drive the grounds of appeal. And then what I was proposing to do is deal with the grounds um, in, in, in turn, um, they largely fall into groups in, in the sense that the first four grounds um, really go to the point on which I've, I've just been addressing your lordship. The other grounds deal with slightly more discrete points. Um, so if I may, I was going to deal um, with, with the law. Um, starting with the position in relation to scheme of arrangements, um, your lordships are all extremely familiar with schemes of arrangements, as your, your lordship knows. Um, they were introduced by the Companies Act 1862. Um, they're a long-standing feature of um, English law. Um, the 
principles um, governing schemes are very familiar. Um, the key point for present purposes, as, as your lordships um, will know, is that under a scheme, um, it's essential to obtain the necessary majorities in the meeting of each class of creditors or members. Um, so, again, as your lordship knows, as well established case law determining how you go about setting the classes, determining whether you need more than one class or not. But the essential feature of a scheme of arrangement is that you need to get the necessary majorities in each class. Now, and just, just pausing there, um, <clears throat> just to expand that, unpack that just a tiny bit. The reason people are put into different classes is because it is, under a scheme at least, is because their rights are um, not sufficiently similar that they can be expected to consult together with a view to their common interest. Exactly. In other words, you, you start from an assumption you should put people in the same class unless um, there is a dissimilarity of rights, which means they can't... Can't consult, consult together. Can't consult together. And I think it's right, isn't it, that that same principle, perhaps not in absolute terms, but has underpinned <coughs> the approach to class composition in relation to plans. Absolutely right, yes. And in this particular case, I don't think I've seen a copy of the convening judgment, the class judgment. It may be that it's there. And I just there is, well, we, 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 I'm not sure it's in the bundles. We can certainly provide it. I assume there. that the view is that the reason that the Sun note holders are in different classes is because it's thought that their rights against the company under their notes <coughs> are sufficiently dissimilar yes. at, when viewed in light of what they were given under the plans that they could not consult together with a view to their common interest. Correct. So you start from the proposition that the reason people are in different classes is because they don't have a sufficient commonality of rights. Exactly, exactly. You're looking exactly right. And it was the, the plan companies... <coughs> formulation um, whereby they put the sons into separate classes that that was the formulation they put before yeah. the judge at the convening hearing has been the correct formulation and obviously the reason they did that is that so far as the sons are concerned they have a very clear difference in rights coming out of the plan because they have different maturity dates on their debt coming out of the plan um, so far as the 2024 sons are concerned they get security in addition but your logic's absolutely right. So far as different sons are concerned, they're essentially all being offered a different indeed, commercial deal. If you go back to Hawke, which is still really a, a leading yes. court of appeal authority in this entire field in relation to class composition, you start from the proposition that for purposes of class composition, it where the relevant alternative is a formal insolvency, um, that it's the rights in that insolvency which are the basis for class composition, coupled with the rights under the plan. Exactly. Uh, scheme, sorry. Um, if you adopt the same approach, in this case, um, you would say, well, under a formal insolvency, as an alternative, the rights of all the notes, Frank, Arrow, Passu. They've got the same rights, yes. But they are put into different classes for voting purposes. That must be because it's recognised that they are not treated equivalently under the plan. That's exactly right. Exactly and so right. the starting proposition here is that there is a dissimilarity of rights yes. under the plan between the different classes of note holders. Exactly, exactly right. Because otherwise you would have put them into the same class. Your lordship's exactly right. And I mean, I mean, there, is, there is a tendency under plans to go in completely the opposite direction than under schemes. And to have as many classes as you can in order to in the hope that one of them will vote in favour so you can exercise a cramp yes. down power. But that's not legally accurate. No, it's not. It's the same test for classes. It should be the same test. It's the same test for classes. I'm, I'm just looking at the schemes of arrangement. The reason why you're put into separate classes if your interests diverge is it's you Parliament has, has decided that as long as the requisite majority of people who are in the same interest as you think that it's the sensible and rational thing to do, then that is something the court might well say is a sensible and rational thing yes. to do. But it's quite a different thing to 
to be in a class with people whose interests diverge from you because they may be motivated by different interests from yours. Exactly right, my, my lord. So, and just as a note, adding to my lord's point, at some point you will doubtless be addressing us as to the relevance or otherwise of the fact that of the pure 2029 note holders, by my arithmetic, 65.5% voted in favour. Yes. That's the, I think that is the correct comparison. Yes, I mean, I will address you on that. I mean, they were a tiny proportion of the overall um, 2029 notes. Um, I think it's some, they, they rep, the pure holders represent something like 3% right, of the total. But, but of the pure note holders, I mean, Mr. Bayfield, I think, says 29 out of 35. Yeah. Well, I don't, as currently, as I currently look at it, that's not the right comparator because numerosity doesn't play a part in Part 26A. Yeah. But by the same point could be made in a different way that by value, 65.5%, I think it is by my arithmetic, but I hope somebody can check it, of the pure 2029 note holders voted in favour. Yes, I mean, I'm going to come to that point, but um, ultimately, what we say in relation to that is that. Um, I mean, A, you need to look at the facts of the case. They were 3% of the total. You have to look at what was told to them in the explanatory statement about what was likely to happen under the plan, which is a very important point, and then compare that to what the judge actually, actually found. But ultimately, we say if, if the court is satisfied that there was no proper reason for the departure from the pari passu rule, um, then in our submission, that makes the plan unfair. And the fact that you may get a majority short of the statutory majority who voted in favour doesn't override that, because otherwise all you're doing is effectively saying, well, you don't in fact need 75%, you only need 65%, and as long as 65% vote in favour, that's enough. That, that's not giving weight to what the statute actually says. What the statute says is if you don't hit your 75% in the dissenting class, then our submission the court has to form a view on what's fair. Um, so... I think we just got to the, the question of classes, I mean, and, and my Lord, Lord Justice Nuji touched on um, in our submission what, what is the key point coming out of this, which is that so far as schemes are concerned, there's obviously some, also some very well established laws to the principles to be applied when the court comes to sanction a scheme of arrangement. But in our submission, those principles have all been framed against the context that by the time court comes to sanction a scheme, it will by definition be faced with a situation where there is 75% approval in each of the classes who have a different interest, different right, and therefore what the test the court is applying is against that context. The context of a restructured plan is completely different where cross-class cram down has been invoked because by definition you don't have, um, you, you don't have that, uh, that, that approval in each of the classes. Um, now, well, just to show you your logic, the scheme, the, the test in relation to schemes, um, so we have that in mind. Um, it was helpfully summarised in our submission by my Lord, Lord Justice Snowden, in the Sunbird case, um, which your Lordship will have in the authorities bundle one, uh, behind divider 22. one of mine, but um, <laughs> and helpfully might be um, arranged differently. I think it's in my volume two. Ah. Yes. How many volumes have you got, Mr. Swanson? I've got two volumes of authority. We've got three. Ah, well, that's, uh, that's helpful. But, um, I, I will, uh, perhaps those behind me can give me an image. <coughs> I know, yeah, it's tab 22. Um, so the relevant passage um, begins at paragraph 49 on page 686. Um, where um, my Lord, um, Lord Justice Snowden set out the law, um, and in particular um, at paragraph 52, um, my, my Lord summarised the law um, by reference, um, firstly, to a um, decision in Telewest, just David Richards. That, in turn, refers to a case called National Bank, and it ultimately goes back to um, an extract from the 1957 edition of, of, of Buckley. Um, and there are two, two features um, of that test that are relevant for our purposes, because these are 
points that were picked up on and applied by the judge, we say, um, in an incorrect way. Um, the first is the point just above letter J, which is um, what's sometimes referred to as the honest and intelligent person test or, or the rationality test. And essentially, that is simply the requirement that the court has to be satisfied that the arrangement is one that an honest and intelligent person might reasonably approve. And then the second point, um, just underneath J, is that although the court does not sit merely to see that the majority are acting bona fide and thereupon to register the decision of the meeting, at the same time the court will be slow to differ from the meeting unless there's an issue about the, constitu the consultation of a class or the meeting's not considered the matter reviewed to the interests of the class or there's a blot. I mean, it, it's the same basic point. You, you ask, first of all, is the explanatory statement adequate and accurate? Yes. Because otherwise you're not properly consulting the class. Secondly, you ask whether the people in the class are representative of the class in the sense that if there's a, for example, if there's a very low turnout, the number of people who turned up might not be representative of the class as a whole. Thirdly, you ask whether the majority have some other interest to serve, some special interest to serve. Lateral interest, yes. Uh, adverse to the class. In other words, that they're voting in a way that a pure class member wouldn't. And once you've sort of satisfied yourself, you have a um, coherent, properly representative majority. Yes. Uh, unless they're all bonkers, you basically accept that they're the best judges of their own commercial interests. So the, the, I've, I'm personally not aware of any scheme or plan that's ever been refused on the basis that no rational person could possibly have voted in favour, all other thing, of those other things being equal. I don't think there is one. I mean, simply, uh, I mean, as your Lordship knows, I mean, th there's very few examples of sanction being refused of a scheme generally. I mean, those cases where sanction was refused, such as the first Amigo scheme, have been tied up with issues such as the explanatory statement wasn't adequate or the turnout was very low. Um, I mean, your, your Lordship's right, there isn't a case where the court has departed from the views of a properly informed, properly constituted meeting or meetings of creditors. In I the mean, Sunbird is an example of that because I refused to sanction this scheme on the basis that the explanatory statement yeah. was grossly inadequate. Um, but it came back yeah. with a better one, and the same people voted, give, I think, give or take, in the same way. <coughs> and it was sanctioned. Yes. And that's exactly what happened on. Amigo, the first one, got refused sanction um, because Mr. Justice Miles thought, amongst other things, that the explanatory statement was not up to the task and the turnout was very low. It came back from Amigo too and it was sanctioned. So your Lordship's right. Um, I mean, those are the, those, those two features um, um, are obviously important aspects of the scheme test. The, the other point, just to draw to your Lordship's attention, because this also formed part of the judge's reasoning is a point that comes out of um, the quote from the judgment of Mr. Justice David Richards at the top of 688. And it's the point just below letter B, um, which is that that test also makes clear that the scheme proposed need not be the only fair scheme or even in the court's view the best scheme. And that's something, it's one of these phrases that is often trotted out um, on applications to sanction schemes of arrangement, and it was a, a phrase, as we'll see, that was picked up by the judge in the present case. Now, we'll come back to this, as it obviously relates to one of our grounds of appeal in terms of the judge's approach to the law, but we say, whilst that approach is obviously well established and makes obvious sense in relation to a scheme of arrangement, the same principles can't simply be transplanted over and applied in the same way to a restructuring plan where cross-class cram down is relied on as the judge sought to do. Well, fair, I mean, you've got to be careful. Justice David Richards um, said immediately above that, I mean, the court must be satisfied it, it, that it is a fair scheme. Yes. 
No, he's, he's... There's no doubt whatever you mean by fair, and, and fair, I think, you may say, has different connotations in relation to part 26 and part 26A, because whatever it is, it, it isn't just the judge sitting under a palm tree and saying, well, this is what I think you yes. should be doing. Yes. Unless you're doing this, it's not fair. Um, those words that it need not be the the only fair scheme or the best, or in the court's view, the best scheme, are just telling the court that it doesn't have a roving jurisdiction to force the parties to comply with what it, the, the court, thinks should yes. be happening. And we would respectfully not disagree with that. I mean, the mischief, as we'll come to in the present case, is, is in our submission the judge has taken that principle and applied it in the restructuring plan cross-class cram down contest and said that because of that he doesn't need to consider what the alternatives to the plan might be and that is the mischief and we, we, to be clear we're not taking issue with that that test and um, certainly not in the scheme of arrangement context but what has happened in this case where, where the judge has gone wrong is applying that in the cross-class cram down contest and therefore closing his mind to what the alternatives might justifiably have been to this plan. And in that submission, that has to be taken into account in terms of assessing whether it's fair to exercise cross-class cram down. You say you're going to come back to the Supreme One, so this may not be the right place to ask you about this, but it's implicit in what Mr Justice David Richards is saying that the court may think of a particular scheme. Well, I can think of a better one, but that's not the question question is whether this one yeah. is fair because it's a yes no question it's not it's not the court rewriting the scheme either it's approved or it's not exactly um, isn't exactly the same true of a part 26a plan that the, the court is being asked yes or no am i going to approve it or not and the question is do i think it's fair and as my lord says that may be a different test of fairness but whatever it is do i think it passes the test not could I improve it in some way? Well, it must be no, because they're crucially different. In, in the context of a scheme, when you come to the stage of applying this test, it has been approved by a 75% majority by number, and um, by, by, by value and a majority by number in each of the classes. And therefore, when you get to the sanction stage, it's appropriate for the court to apply what might be characterised as a fairly light touch but you're, you're still, as Mr Justice David Richards points out, you're still imposing the scheme on dissentient. Because oh. a 75% majority means there could be up to 25% who have either not um, voted in favour or positively dissented. You might, but in the restructuring plan cross class cram down context, you might have a case where nobody has voted in favour of the dissenting class. But that might be a different type of case well, from a case when 74% have voted. Well, possibly, but I mean, and, and we, we don't say that the, the level of vote in, in the class is irrelevant, but there is a sort of fundamental difference in approach, in, in our view, in, the, in, in our submission, in that in a scheme of arrangement, you have hit the statutory threshold in relation to each um, class. And therefore, by the time you come to sanction it, by definition, you've got to a stage where each of the classes with different rights has said, yes, by the majority, we think this is in our interest. Now, in a restructuring plan context where cross-class cram down has been invoked, by definition, you've got one or more dissenting classes, to use the language of the legislation. And in our submission, you can't simply apply the same approach. And we submit that where the court is being asked as a matter of discretion to impose a plan on one or more dissenting classes, um, the court needs to form a view on whether or not the plan is fair. Now, we'll come to it. We don't say that the court has to be satisfied that the plan is the best plan that's possible. Oh, I thought you did say that. No, we don't. That's okay. My learned friend mischaracterizes our right. submission on this. I'm going to come to that as well. But what we do say is the court needs to look at what the possible alternatives to the plan are and ask itself where, whether the plan is fair in light of the possible alternatives. But, but why isn't that? I mean, that's a question in both contexts, though, isn't it? I mean, I'm not sure that we're, there's much to argue about this, is well, there? I mean, it, I mean, you accept, I mean, you, you've given us your reasons for saying why it's not fair yeah. in this particular case. But 
even if we were dealing with um, a scheme that didn't involve the use of the cram down power, the court would still have to, as it's clear from these authorities, to have to ask itself whether it was a fair scheme in vis a vis the exercise of its discretion. I mean, if the 25% were up in arms about it, the same point is going to arise. Well, I mean, it may be, I mean, to some extent, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing it an open door, but what I'm trying to lay the ground deal with is essentially the judge's, the judge's approach, which is that he took that principle and used that as a reason to say, well, when the court is dealing with cross-class cram down, it doesn't need to consider what the alternatives are. It just looks at this plan and doesn't effectively close its mind to what the others might be. And we submit that that is wrong. Um, it's wrong as a matter of principle, but also it's wrong um, because we say the context is different you can't simply transplant over scheme of arrangement jurisprudence to the cross-class cram down under the restructuring plan. Um, I mean, if your lordship's right that actually <coughs> our point would bite even under the scheme of arrangement jurisprudence, then I mean, in, in, in a sense, that's also an answer um, to the, the way the judge approached it. Um, but I mean, we do say you have, you have to have in mind that when it comes to cross-class cram down and restructuring plan, it is a rather different you haven't got the majority in each of the classes. Now, um, so that, that's essentially the law in relation to schemes of arrangement, and we'll, we'll come and look how the judge applied it. Um, restructuring plans, um, as I mentioned earlier, were introduced in 2020 by way of an amendment um, to the Companies Act made by the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act 2020. Um, that introduced a new Part 26A into the Companies Act. Um, the legislation follows similar schemes to the existing Part 26, on which it's clearly modelled, um, but there are some very important differences. Um, if your lordships have the first authorities bundle behind divider two, um, your lordships will have Part 26A. Um, it begins at uh, page 28 of that uh, divider. Um, and I'll just draw your Lordship's attention to the, the principal differences from the, the scheme of arrangement um, procedure, and then we can look at what the one is that matters for our purposes. Um, in 901A, um, provision is made for the application of Part 26A. Um, as your Lordship can see, it applies to a company, but also um, in contradistinction to the scheme of arrangement, jurisdiction conditions A and B have to be satisfied. So there's two threshold conditions that need to be met. Um, 901C on page 31 uh, is um, the first of the two key um, substantive provisions which deals with the court's order for the holding of a meeting or meetings. Um, that largely follows the equivalent provision for schemes of arrangement, which is section 896. Um, but subsections 3, 4 and 5 are all new. And one of the things um, that can be done under subsection 4 in particular is essentially to disenfranchise um, a credit or member who doesn't have an economic interest in the company. So you can apply essentially to simply remove them from having any ability to vote at all. So people who are out of the money on any view. Correct. Um, and then the, the two provisions that really matter then for our purposes um, are, are sections 901F and section 901G. Um, 901F is page 36. Um, subsection 1 um, is similar to the equivalent provision in section 8991 for schemes, save that it's only necessary to achieve a majority of 75% by value and not also a majority by number. So the majority by number um, requirement has dropped out. Um, but the key change um, is actually section 9012A, um, which says subsection 1 is subject to 901G. So 
nine, under nine, as a subparagraph one, you have to get the 75% majority in each class. But that is subject to 901G. And then you go to 901G, which is page 38. Um, and this is entirely new. Um, and this is what's colloquially referred to as the cross-class cram-down power. Um, and as your Lordship can see from subsection one, this section applies if the compromise or arrangement is not agreed by a number representing at least 75% in value of a class of creditors or members. And that's referred to as the dissenting class. And it's obvious that there may be more than one dissenting class, but essentially a dissenting class is anyone that hasn't approved it by the 75% majority. <clears throat> And then subsection two, if conditions A and B are met, the fact that the dissenting class has not agreed the compromise arrangement does not prevent the court from sanctioning it. Um, and then there's the two conditions. Condition A is what's um, been referred to as the no worse off test, essentially a threshold condition that you have to be satisfied that none of the dissenting class would be any worse off than they would be in the event of a relevant alternative. That's defined in subsection four. And then subsection five is the second condition, condition B, um, which is that the compromise or arrangement has been agreed um, by uh, a, a class by the requisite majority um, of persons who would receive a payment or have a genuine economic interest in the company in the event of a relevant alternative. So those are the, the, those are the two conditions. In addition, the court retains its general discretion um, as to whether or not to exercise the cross-class cram-down. So as, as my Lord Lord Justice Stone pointed out in the Virgin Active case, there are essentially three elements that need to be satisfied before the cross-class cram-down power can be exercised. Firstly, condition A needs to be met. Secondly, condition B needs to be met. And thirdly, the court needs to be satisfied that it should exercise its discretion to invoke the cross-class cram-down power. Um, and in our submission, as we'll, we'll come to, this is a rather different um, exercise the court is embarked on to the simple exercise under section 899, where it has got the requisite majority in each class and is simply asking itself, should it proceed to sanction the scheme? So, um, my lord, we'll come back to those points when we deal with the ways in which we, we say the judge applied the wrong legal test. Um, before I do that, I did just want to make some points about the facts of the present case, because ultimately um, this case and our submission turns on the facts. Before, before you put away the law, yes. um, we, we've got a, a little bit of government uh, documents. We do. Are, are we going to be addressed at all on what Parliament's purpose was in introducing this new power? Because by definition, it, it does enable sentience to be crammed down. And yes. That must have been thought to have some useful purpose. Oh, it does. It has a very useful purpose. But the, the question is, what test should the court apply in deciding whether or not to exercise that power? Now, on, on that point, um, there's actually very little guidance in the um, explanatory material. I, I, I'm not going to, I hope I'm not going to quibble with just phraseology, but it's, it's not so much a test, but it's um, what factors should guide the court in the exercise of its discretion, isn't it? Yes, that's I mean, a better way of putting it. The one thing that's unlikely to come out of this or indeed any other case is, quote, a test. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the point is that Parliament has given the court a discretion. We are in search of the framework of factors which a judge should apply in the exercise of his discretion, yes. rather than sitting <coughs> sort of saying, well, I think it's fair. That's a much better way of putting it. I mean, that, that's essentially um, what we say. And turning back to my Lord's question, what the explanatory <coughs> materials don't give you is much guidance as to what those factors are, what weight the court ought to give to some of them vis-a-vis -vis the other, what the but, overall... But you, you might have thought that they would express the government's view as to why it was in the public interest to introduce this new power, and that might inform the exercise the Lord has referred to, what factors should be taken into account. 
Well, I mean, it undoubtedly introduces flexibility and means that you can implement restructurings where in the past you wouldn't have been able to do so. So it, it certainly expands the ability of the court. Well, it, 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 yeah, I mean, it stops a particular class from exercising the right of veto, which they would have been able to exercise under a scheme yes. by voting against. Exactly. Because I mean, the whole point about class composition is that you create a right of veto in a particular class, and as or Justice Chadwick pointed out in Hawke, um, that right of veto, the holdout right, can in certain circumstances mean that the scheme, yes. well it will mean the scheme doesn't go through. Exactly. So, so to pick my Lord's point, I mean, Parliament was essentially saying that there will be circumstances in which a dissenting class can, that the right of veto that would otherwise be given to the dissenting class can be overridden by the court. Quite, and that, absolutely. And we don't dispute that for a second, but the question is, well, what factors do you um, take <coughs> into account in deciding whether or not to invoke that power against the dissenting class? You, you say you don't get any help from any of the government materials which led to the passing of the Act? Not on that point, no. Not on that point. I mean, we will come to it. I mean, there is there is a reference in the expansion materials to saying the court won't sanction the plan if it's not just and equitable to do so. And that phrase has been considered in some of the first instance authorities and has been considered not to be in itself particularly enlightening. Because of course the court won't sanction a plan that it doesn't think is just and equitable, and for that reason, um, seems, if I may say so correctly, the court hasn't got much from that. Um, it leaves open, I think, the question of how one assembles the relevant factors to take into account for exercising the cross-class crown power. Um, now, before I turn to the grounds, I just wanted then to. But can I? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Mr. Smith, can I just ask you one, one final question while we've got the legislation? Yes, of course, my lord. The, the structure of it, is, is this right, is that um, the power which the judge comes to exercise if conditions A and B are satisfied under G is the 901F power? Correct. So, in a way, whatever whatever goes for 901F in terms of what is the appropriate approach goes for 901G. I mean, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't alter the power that's being exercised. It merely, subject to those two conditions, allows the court to exercise that power. It does. Uh, so your lordship is absolutely right. What the court is doing is um, exercising the power under 901F. Um, absolutely, one can see um, that in doing that, the court, as a minimum, will apply the test in relation to um, the schemes of arrangement. But that is the minimum in our submission. The real question that this appeal raises is what additional factors, if any, the court has to take into account in deciding whether it's appropriate to exercise the power under 901F in reliance on 901F2A. So that, your logic's absolutely right, though, in terms of how the legislation is, is structured. Um, so I was going to turn to the facts of the present case, um, which, as I say, in our submission are very important. Um, all of the points which I want to make were and are, in fact, common ground and not in dispute. Um, the first point um, we, we've already dealt with to some extent, but it's worth um, reiterating that concerns the existing debt structure of the Adler Group. Um, as your lordships will have seen, the Adler Group is a German residential property business. Um, the group issued the SUNs, the various unsecured notes that, which we've seen set out in paragraphs 11 and 12 of the judgment. Um, they have different maturity dates. They're all unsecured. Um, and they were all they're all guaranteed by the group parent company. Um, Adler Group SA. Now, the sums were originally issued by Adler Group SA, um, but in order to facilitate the plan, a new English company was incorporated. That's the plan company. 
um, and it um, purported to become an issuer, replacement issuer, under an issuer substitution clause in the notes. You say purported to, that was in dispute below, but it's no longer in dispute, is it? Well, it's in dispute in Germany as between the old issuer and various of the creditors. So, oh, I see. So but as far as we're concerned? So far as your Lordship is concerned, that was an issue that was in dispute before the judge. It's not, however, an issue on this appeal, um, and your Lordships don't need to concern yourselves at that point. I just mention that by way of... I mean, it is, in other contexts, a contentious yeah. question about whether... Um, that type of technique um, for the to give the English court jurisdiction is uh, abusive or bad form shopping yes. or whatever the uh, expression might be applied to it. Yes. But whatever is the case in other cases on this appeal, correct? We're assuming jurisdiction is properly correct. seized by the English. We're not taking a, a point on that. I just mention it so that um, your lordships understand why it is. Um, Ad AGPS Bonco PLC is is is, is the issuer. Well, can, I, the can, I, can I just ask? Yes. Suppose the German court in due course decides that the substitution of the issuer was not effective as a matter yeah. of German law. What's the consequence for the plan? The consequence for the plan. Well, the. So the proceedings in Germany are essentially a debt claim by the Sun holders against the original issuer. So effectively, they're simply saying, well, look, you're still our, our debtor. We don't accept you managed to substitute yourself out of it. So they, they're suing the original issuer for the amount of the notes, as I understand it. If they won that, they'd get a judgment against the original issuer. And then I assume it would I assume go into liquidation at that point. Into an insolvency proceeding. I, mean, I don't know. I don't know that for sure, but one assumes that would be the, the likely outcome. Um, and we'll come back to that because that is actually relevant to our, our eighth ground. That's a little down our batting order, but it is um, that, that is really the subject matter of our eighth ground of appeal. Um, so that that's the first point. In, so your lordship's got the point. It's all unsecured debt. Um, the second point, as I say, is it's common ground that the relevant alternative to the plan was the entry into formal insolvency proceedings. And if I can just show your Lordships that in the judgment, because it's obviously a key point, um, it's in core bundle two, behind divider five, uh, page 760. I think our core bundles are probably differently arranged from yours as well. This is our volume three. Ah, not sure why that would be. Yeah, but yes. Oh, I understand I've got double-sided bundles, which may, may explain the difference. So I, I'll try and use the tab numbers, if I may. This is, I think we're, we're largely just going to be referring to the judgment and the skeleton arguments. So, um, so it's five for the judgment. Five, five for the judgment. And all I wanted to um, show you, and just to make the point that this was and is common ground, is the second sentence of paragraph 10. Um, it appeared to be common ground that if the court did not sanction the plan, the key members of the group would have no choice but to file for formal insolvency proceedings. Um, and in the case of the plan company, um, that would be an insolvency proceeding in England, either an administration or liquidation. Um, and in the case of the parent company, um, it was said in the explanatory statement that it would go into an insolvency proceeding in Germany. So you say that the plan company would be liquidated in England. Does it have any assets? The plan company, um, no. no. It's, got a, it's got a right under a guarantee um, against the uh, original issue of the parent company. So it, it has. It does have that asset. Has the shows in action, if you like, but it's not a. Um, it's not a vehicle with, um, with with other assets. So just to be clear, is this right that in in the relevant alternative? You say the relevant alternative in identifying the relevant alternative. The relevant alternative is a formal insolvency proceeding in the UK and or Germany um, immediately. Um, well, that was that was common ground. Yes, it was. There was no suggestion that there would be any delay in entering into that. So the twenty twenty four notes would never actually come up for payment out. Of Correct. In, it, it wasn't in the relevant alternative. In fact, that they would. 
they'd be accelerated as well. Yeah. Yes, your lordship's exactly. It wasn't suggested that the the liquidation or administration of the relevant alternative would only take place after the maturity of the 2024 notes. It was effectively, it was all driven by impending maturities of other sets of notes lower down the group. And the, the suggestion was, if we don't do the plan, it will go in um, to liquidation. Adler had four or 500 million exactly. euro of, of notes become due at the end of April, I think, or April 2023. Yes. Uh, that that was the immediate pressure. And that's why things were very heavily expedited. Um, it was essentially the, the plan company needed to get the, the plan through very quickly. Um, so th there, w there was no dispute about, and there is no dispute, that the relevant alternative um, to the well, plan. You say it needed to get it through very quickly. I mean, something we'll come back to. Yeah. Um, by the time it came in front of the judge, no doubt that date was very much in everybody's mind. Yeah. But it's not as if it came as a revelation to everybody. No. I mean, this is one of, I mean, there's a sort of limit to how many points I can take on this pill, but th this was one of our complaints, which we made to the judge at the time, which is that the plan company knows this maturity is coming along and it's known this for years. And then it waits until the last minute, effectively shoves everything in front of the court at the last minute puts huge pressure on us to respond to it with no time. And then effectively says to the judge, well, you need to produce a judgment in um, a matter of uh, days, because otherwise we're going to go into insolvency. Well, you're well resourced and can no doubt see it coming as well. I'm more concerned about the pressure on the yeah. judge, actually. Well, I, we, we entirely agree with respect. Um, but he's, he's obviously left in a very difficult situation by that point, as our, as, I mean, we we, we were as well. I mean, I take your lordship's point about us, us being better resourced, which we clearly were. It, it is a it is a real difficulty. Um, but as I say, I mean, I'm not taking that. I'm not. I'm not taking that point as a as a as a ground of appeal. Um, but it is it is part of the context when you, you look at the pressure that, that the judge was put under. Um, I mean, what matters, as I say, is that the, the relevant alternative was. The in, insolvency in England of the plan company, in Germany of um, the parent. Um, the key point is that it is indisputably the case that in both those sets of proceedings, the claims of the holders of the sons would rank the payment pari passu. Um, and if your lordships go through to paragraph 176 of the judgment. Um, there's a helpful passage where um, the judge um, correctly uh, sets out what the common ground was. Um, it's common ground that the relevant alternative to the plan is that the plan company and the other group companies going through formal insolvency. In the case of the plan company, this is an insolvency process in England, either for administration or liquidation. In the case of the parent company, this is an insolvency process in Germany. It's also common ground that in both sets of proceedings, the claims of the plan creditors were ranked the payment pari passu. And it's that sentence that is. And then, as the judge rightly said, we, we obviously rely on that as an important part of our, our case. Now, um, one of the features of the pari passu treatment is that the existing maturity date ceased to be of any relevance. Um, for your lordship's note, um, we explain why that is in paragraph 24 of our skeleton argument um, and also footnote 4. So this is behind divider 9, page 9, 4, 8 and 9, 4, 9 of the bundles. Um, and it, it's, as I say, not in dispute, um, but it's the final sentence of paragraph 24 on page 9, 4, 9. Such a right of acceleration would arise under the terms of the sons, and in any case, in both an English liquidation and a German liquidation, all future and contingent debts are treated as presently due, as at the date of commencement of the insolvency. Um, and then the footnote, as far as England is concerned, that's um, fairly uncontroversial. You get it from a number of places, including the Lehman Brothers Authority. So far as Germany is concerned, 
is the effect of section 41, paragraph 1 of the insolvent order, um, which pithily says liabilities that are not due are considered as due. These are not contingent debts, are they? They're future debts. They're future right. debts. Yes. Um, now, that is obviously a very important feature of Harry Passu distribution. All of the outstanding debt, in effect, gets accelerated and ranks Harry Passu for payment from the assets. Um, as your lordships know, the assets are then realised by the office holders, and that takes as long as it takes. Um, and all the debt bears any shortfall from the assets equally. Importantly, all the debt bears the risk of movement in the asset prices equally. So if the value of the assets deteriorate after the commencement of the insolvency, <coughs> that risk is shared equally amongst all the unsecured debt which ranks peri passu. So if you have a liquidation that commences, and it's a liquidation under which property has to be realised, and that may take quite some time, then any risk of a deterioration in the property prices is shared equally amongst the unsecured creditors. And conversely, they would all share equally in any improvement in the prices. Now, um, the third point on the fact is that the plan in the present case um, provides for a wind down of the group, the realisation of its assets and the distribution of the proceeds. Um, as we discussed earlier, it's therefore what might be described as a wind down plan rather than a plan seeking to rescue the plan company and the group as a going concern. Now, as I said, this isn't a feature that um, is really elaborated on in the judgment in, 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 in our submission um, incorrectly, but it's clear that this is the position from the plan company's evidence. And I, I don't believe it to be in dispute. Um, well, the judge did spend quite a lot of the judgment discussing how much was likely to be distributed in the event of the plan going ahead? Um, he did. I mean, what he didn't do is really take into account the fact that the plan was a wind-down plan when it came to the exercise of his discretion. No, but there's no there's no doubt if you read the judgment that that's what's envisaged. Yes, <laughs> indeed. It's not, in, it's not in dispute. It's just when you get to the question of him looking at how are we treated under the plan, um, in our submission, he doesn't take into account sufficiently that the fact fact that this plan is simply a, a different means of winding down the group and that's part of the reason why we say there's no good reason for departing from Terry Passage treatment but you're logically absolutely right it's not in dispute that the plan is a wind down plan it, it's not a plan that seeks to rescue the plan company and the group of the going concern um, if I can just show your lordship the evidence on that because it is it is actually um, illuminating to see what the plan envisages um, if your lordship's got the supplemental supplementary bundle um, behind divider one um, is what was called the BCG report, the Boston Consulting Report, or also the comparative report, and, and this was essentially um, the, the key financial evidence that was put forward by the plan company to the creditors as part of the explanatory statement. Um, if your lordships go to page 36 of the, um, the bundle, um, this is page 34 of the report, page 36 of the bundle, you get a description of what's um, referred to as the management case. And the management case was, in, essential, in essence, the management plan as to what was to take place if the restructuring plan was implemented. Um, and page 34 of the report, page 36 of the bundle, under the heading, um, well, you can see under, uh, firstly, under initial situation, it says management has developed a business plan based on the assumption that the restructuring plan is successfully implemented by April 2023, and that, that's the management case that's referred to. And then that is helpfully described um, under the next heading. Um, the management case envisages disposals of in total 2.8 billion euros gross asset value yielding assets, 1.7 billion euros 
risk asset value development assets through upfront sales until December 2024. So there's a significant amount of sales sales that will take place by December 2024. And then if you then skip on, it then says, based on plan sale proceeds in the management case, portfolio of 9,744 residential units, 2.6 billion gross asset value, and selected development assets of 0.5 billion euros gross asset value will remain by December 2024. The subsequent deleveraging plan consists of the disposal of all remaining yielding assets by the last quarter of 2026, the disposal of all development assets by the last quarter of 2025, the liquidation of all entities and cons corresponding release of all FTEs, full-time employees, um, until 2027, and the repayment of all outstanding debt at par if and when sufficient liquidity is available. So it, it's clear that what was um, envisaged under the plan is, is a wind down plan. And the way that is structured, at least the way that is explained there, is in two stages. Firstly, an initial disposal program by December 2024, then a remaining disposal program, which would be complete by 2026. The effectively um, redundancy of all of the employees and the liquidation of the, the remaining entities. I, I mean, to state blindingly obvious, the restructuring plan is in essence a debtor in possession liquidation. Yes, as opposed to down. as opposed to a liquidation where an office holder comes in and displaces the management. Exactly, that's the only difference, though. Really, I mean, you've got you've got a, in effect a wind down taking place under the control of the directors rather than under the control. An insolvency office holder. I mean, it's it is the sort of thing that you used to do for insurance companies by way of a scheme. Yeah. Where you couldn't put in at a time when you couldn't put um, insurance companies into administration yes. for a similar purpose. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. But I mean, fun that you can. I mean, I hope your logic to see why we refer to that because ultimately. One of the points we feel very strongly about is, is if all the plan company is doing is effectively a wind down um, by a different name or under the control of a different person, what is the basis or justification for treating us so differently to the way we would be treated in the formal insolvency? What, what's the justification for that? There is none. And that's why this point, and I, I do submit it doesn't feature sufficiently in the, in the judge's reasoning when it comes to discretion, but I think that's why. This point is so fundamental, and we respectfully submit. Um, now, the fourth point is the question of how the sons are proposed to be treated under the plan, and the dramatic way in which we say that differs from how they would be treated in the relevant alternative of formal liquidation. Now, th there's four aspects in our submission to that departure from the Perry Passu treatment. Um, First, most obviously, is the question of maturities. Um, as your lordships know, the sons are given different maturity dates coming out of the plan. The 2024 sons were given a maturity date of the 31st of July, 2025. And the other sons were all given maturity dates reflecting their existing contractual maturity dates. So you get all different maturity dates coming out of the plan. And in our case, that means that our sons have a maturity date of the 14th of July, 2029. And that is obviously a stark difference from the way in which the sons would be treated in the relevant alternative of the formal liquidation, in which they would all, in effect, have the same maturity date. So that, in, in our submission, um, is a stark um, it's a stark departure from the Pari Passu treatment we could expect. It's also um, a stark difference in treatment between the sons as between each other under the plan. Now, the second aspect of the way in which the treatment under the plan departs materially from the position in a formal liquidation is the security which is given to certain of the debt. 
Um, this falls into two categories, two subcategories. Under the plan itself, security was given to the 2024 sums. In addition to that, under the wider restructuring, security was given to certain convertible notes that were issued by the parent. So that doesn't that aspect doesn't take place under the plan itself, but it takes place as part of the wider restructuring of which the plan was a part. So the, the, the two ways in which security is given. Um, that's notwithstanding that all of those claims, the 2024 notes and the convertible notes are unsecured claims which would rank pari passu in an insolvency. The convertible notes are not very significant in money terms. Well, I think 160 million euros. I mean, it yes, but when you're talking about 3.2 yeah, billion. Relatively, relatively less significant. Um, I mean, obviously, the, the 2024, the security given to the 2024 notes is the more egregious element from our client's perspective. But, but equally, as we'll come to, there isn't really any proper explanation for giving the security to the convertible notes either. Um, but you're logically right, relatively, it's, it, 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 it's less. There's so, also security given to new money, but presumably you don't complain of that in itself. No, that's, that is different, um, and that was going to be my third aspect. Um, the, um, that obviously is a departure from the carry passive principle, the incurring of the new money. Um, what we say about that is set out in paragraph 40 of our skeleton. If I can just take you to that, because um, I think that will uh, help explain um, exactly how the figures work. Um, Um, and if your lordships go to 955 of paragraph 40 of our skeleton argument, um, how this worked was that under the plan, um, a total of 937.5 million euros of new money was raised. Um, and that money was effectively secured by prior ranking security, which ranked ahead of the sums, all of the sums. So that comes in in return for security. Of that, 800 million was used to repay the debt at Adlerie. So, so, so far as that's concerned, that money comes in, but there's a corresponding benefit by way of the discharge of the Adlerie debt. Um, and effectively, the Adlerie debt had priority over your debt because it's lower down. Correct, exactly. So, so far as the 800 million comes in, one gets a euro for euro benefit by having the, the, the structurally senior debt discharge. Um, where it becomes problematic is that that debt is more expensive than the debt it's replacing. But also, not all the new money is being used to repay the Adlerie note. And there's this residual balance of 137.5 million. Um, and that incurs interest. And effectively, if you add um, everything up, um, there's additional interest payable, or additional debt payable of 487 million euros. And that's debt which would not be present in a relevant alternative of a formal liquidation. And that, that essentially comprises the, the new money that's not used to repay the Adlerie notes, um, the more expensive pricing of the new money. But if all the other classes of sums thought that this was a price worth paying for um, enhanced realisations under the restructuring plan, why should you alone be entitled to hold out and complain about it? Well, because, I mean, at this stage, all I'm saying is these are effectively the ways in which the plan has departed from the peri passu distribution. I mean, when it, when it comes to the question of proper justification, I mean, the ones that um, matter for our purposes are obviously the maturity dates and the True, prior sorry, ranking I, security. I, I, I was reading subparagraph 3 of paragraph 40. Yes. I mean, where you baldly make... Baldly, not 
boldly, or maybe boldly, make the submission that that was a reason not to sanction the plan? Well, from our perspective, um, it is, because if you look at the position of the 2029s, under the plan, they're effectively put behind all of that additional money. So, But so, is that, so are all the other classes of sub. Well, they are, but the, the, the trouble is if you're at the back of the queue, it but, affects but then it, more. But then it comes back to yeah. your priority point. It does. I, mean, it, so the, the, right. I, mean, I accept it's not independent of the priority point in the sense that the reason the new money affects us more is because we're at the back of the queue and therefore we're the ones who bear more of the risk that after you've paid the new money and the other sums, there won't be anything left for so, us. So in a sense, it doesn't add to the point. If you, I mean, if you were treated equally with all the other classes of sums, yeah. the fact that new money comes in which gets a priority um, fulfills the sort of requirements of the judge's test at paragraph 74, doesn't it? I think, I mean, uh, I mean if, we were, if we were ranking equally, I think that's probably right. But one of the, where this is building up to is the point that I want to make is that when you take these points together, there is in effect under this plan that's the precise figure, um, 3.9 billion euros of debt that ranks ahead of us. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, I mean, if you, sorry, I mean, in a sense, I'm leaping ahead a little yes. bit, but just to try and put this point into context. But in paragraph 43 of your skeleton, you, you appear to be suggesting that the objection is that, it quotes, a formal liquidation or plan modelled on formal liquidation would have allowed the orderly realisation of assets and their distributions to creditors without the additional debt being incurred. Yes. Yeah, but the point is, it may be in the interest of creditors generally to incur some new money debt in order to achieve greater realisations yeah. rather than a fire sale. Yes. And so, of itself, the incurring of new money and priority being given to it could be a very valuable yes. um, thing to do. And if, if all classes of creditors, for example, bar one, thought that that was the case, and an equivalently treated class just said no. Yes. That would be a good reason, for example, for exercising the power of cram down. Yes, I accept that. And I think, you know, as I say, I don't think, I don't put this point when it comes to the exercise of discretion as being a point that stands independently of the priority point. Yeah. Um, I mean, all I'm doing at the moment is sort of trying, yeah, okay, to, sort of, okay. I'm I'm trying to sort of just identify the ways in which the plan departs from peri passu. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately, so far as the new money is concerned, the mischief is that because we rank at the the back of the queue, that forms part of the significant wall of debt that has to get paid first before we get anything at all. Um, and therefore, because we're at the back of the queue, we're the ones who bear greater risk in relation to that. So it's, it's not really, I mean, the point that's made in 40 sub 3 is not really an independent point. It's not, I, it doesn't stand independently of the, of the priority point, I think. Um, I, I would accept that. Well, while we're looking at this. Yeah. I understand why you say that there's an additional four eight seven million of debt yes. ahead, but two hundred and one of that has nothing to do with the new money, does it? The the additional interest. Yes, of the two hundred and one is the additional interest. That, that's on. that's got nothing to do with the new money at all. It doesn't, it? but that's that's another consequence. Well, of you've put it all under the heading of new yes. money, as if the new money is going to cost four hundred eighty seven million, but it's it's not like the new money is going to cost you. Uh, 137 and a half um, plus the 24 million interest on that. Yes. But the 200 of it really has nothing to do with new money. It's it's another feature of other people getting paid first. Yes. Because they not only get principal, they get interest. Whereas under the insolvency, everybody would get their principal before anybody got any interest. I assume. Yes. No, your, your logic is absolutely right, and it maybe that is, is too compressed to put that under the heading new money. I mean, the reason we put it there is that forms part. You want the nice big figure. Well, it forms part of the additional debt that ranks. Instead of too ahead. compressed, should I just write down wrong? No, I mean wrong the, place. The, wrong place. You can you can write down wrong place. I mean, the the point in in that sentence is absolutely right because um, when we say in addition, amongst other amounts under the plan, there will be additional interest payable on the mm -hmm. sums. That reflects the fact that under the plan, the interest rate on the sums was increased, and therefore that is something that was payable under the plan that wouldn't be payable. Yes, but that's a completely separate point. Yes, I, it's a little bit compressed. I mean, one of the, I mean, if you look at, no, we, 
we, uh, we, we, we do labour under the page limit a little bit, so these, these points do have to um, be dealt with as, as, as concisely as we can. But it, it, it's a good point. Concision doesn't necessarily mean erroneous. I should have put new money and um, additional, and additional interest. interest. Well, can I just be clear, interest. though? The additional interest, is that payable on your notes as well? Um, yes. If you get to it. If That's you, your point, that, that, is yeah. that by putting additional interest on everybody's notes... We come because, at the back of the queue. Yeah, well, it's, it's all the same point, which is you don't have the, the yes. same priority. Exactly. I mean, I, I, absolutely, as I said that. I mean, no, I, sorry, um, the interest is payable while the notes are outstanding. So why are you at the back of the queue for interest payments? Um, that is true, even on the worst case scenario that was put forward by Knight Frank and uh, your financial advisors, you were going to get 98 million of interest. I'll have, I'll let me check that. I have to come back to that because I think it was, um, it's based on the financial evidence in the FTI report. Um, let me check the point about interest. I'll come back I mean, if there was that. default interest, um, then I would understand your proposition that if there was default interest, you, your notes wouldn't go into default yes. until the end of the queue. Yes. But if it's interest on outstanding amounts from time to time, yes. you're not really at the end of the queue for that, are you? I mean, and, and Yes, I accept that. Let me, I'll, let me check the point about when interest would be paid under the plan. I'll come back to you on, right. come back to you on that. Um, so that's the new money. The fourth point is um, the point we deal with in paragraph 41 of the skeleton. And again, all I'm concerned with at the moment is identifying the ways in which the plan departs from peri passu. And in our submission, another way in which it departs from peri passu is the allocation of most of the equity in the group to the existing shareholders. Um, now, that's not all of the equity, because part of it was given um, to the lenders of the new money. Part of the Why is that a peri passu point under an insolvency? You don't get any of the equity. No, the shareholders would receive nothing in an insolvency. Well, that depends on how much was realised. Well, I mean, in, it, it in, this in, in, in the relevant alternative in this case, um, the shareholders would not have received anything. But nor would you. I mean, there isn't any equity in, in, in the relevant alternative, so nobody would get it. Well, there can be. I mean, if you, if you have a, a relevant alternative liquidation that pays all the creditors, and then there's something left over, then the shareholders would receive that. Yes, but in this, in this case, the evidence was that whoever's evidence was accepted, you wouldn't get 100%. Yes. You wouldn't get enough this to pay my... everybody 100%. So nobody would get but this is... any equity. This is my but point. if there had been much larger, suppose the German real estate market took off in a completely unpredicted way and everybody being paid out, it would go to the shareholders. So yes. why is this a peri passu point? Because you wouldn't it, have got any of it, whatever. So why are you interested? Because, in the it? because from the shareholders' perspective, in the relevant alternative of the liquidation, they would have got nothing at all. That's common mm -hmm. ground. By contrast, under the plan, they get to retain the equity. And if the um, plan company is right, that everything gets paid in full, that will result in a substantial return to the shareholders. But why do you care? You will have been paid in full. Because if, because the, creditor, the creditors are the present economic owners of the business. If, it's, if the business is insolvent in the relevant alternative, as we say it is, the creditors are the economic owners of the business. They are the ones who are entitled to the equity. But I don't, I'm sorry, I, like my lord, I, I struggle with this. Um, if the company is insolvent, then creditors are the, uh, correct, are the economic yes. owners of the business, you, as you put it. But in which case, the shareholders won't get anything anyway. In the so, relevant So there's nothing yeah. to complain about. If, yes. if, if the restructuring plan succeeds and you're paid out in full, your interests are fully satisfied, and what happens to the equity? You've got no but the, basis to stand the complaint. I would understand it. If you were complaining about the allocation of new equity differentially between classes of creditors for no good reason. In other words, if, if you said, look, um, there's going to be new equity allocated and only one class of creditor is entitled to share in that potential upside. Yes. 
and all the others aren't, then I could sort of understand but this you, is you might, where you might get to it. But you seem to be complaining about the treatment of the existing equity. We are. Because the existing shareholders would get nothing in the relevant offset. They're completely out of the money. They're underwater by um, millions of euros. In contrast, the plan gives them most of the equity in the plan company, which if the plan goes according to how the plan company says it will, will result in hundreds of euros. Well, it doesn't give them, it just they, allows them to retain it. It gives them the equity. It, it, but, but, no. Yes, no, I, I have difficulty with this. The, the company, at the moment, um, is looking as if it's heading for insolvency. Yeah. But the whole point of the plan is to produce an orderly wind down which means it will be solvent, not yeah. insolvent. If it's solvent, the owners of the company, the shareholders, get the upside. That's how companies work. I don't, I don't understand what the problem get, with that is. Well, the, the, um, I mean, I'll, uh, I mean, I'll put, put the point this way. I mean, what we are saying is that in the relevant alternative, the shareholders don't get anything. Nor do you, because there's nothing to get. Nobody gets it. Well, we would get something. You wouldn't get any equity. No, we wouldn't get, we, no, we wouldn't get any equity. No one would get any equity exactly. in the relevant alternative. We would get a partial payment on our debt. The shareholders wouldn't get anything. Is it more complicated <coughs> than this? If it's insolvent, nobody gets any equity. Yes. If it's solvent, the shareholders. But get why it. is it that the sh the question? Why is it that in under the restructuring plan the shareholders get the equity? Because they uh, own the company. But they rank behind the creditors. The shareholders always rank behind the creditors. You see, I, I can understand that if one's looking at a restructuring plan in which creditors are being required to take a haircut. Yeah and the existing equity remain untouched, that the, sh the creditors could say, wait a minute, why do we take a haircut on our debt when somebody who ranks behind us remains untouched? Well, that's essentially what's... But, but we're getting our maturity date extended. No, no, you're getting our maturity date extended, and the shareholders get to keep the bulk of the equity in the company in return for nothing. I mean, I'm going to, I mean, let me come back to this point because I mean, all I was trying to do at the moment was identify the ways in which there would be differences from the liquidation. But I mean, we do come back to that. I mean, indeed, um, I mean, we'll look at what the judge said in, in the judgment about it as well. But those are the um, those are the ways in which we say the plan departs from from Harry Passive. Now, um, if I can turn then to our, our grounds of appeal, the first two grounds concerned what we submit were errors of law. Anyway, you, you, you say on that, just to be clear, you say the judge actually understood it better yeah. than we do, um, and, but didn't follow through. Yes. 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 I mean, I wouldn't put it quite in those terms. But, okay, um, so you need to get us to the same place that you yes. got the judge to yes. in order to then make the point that we should, we should follow through on it. Exactly. And I'm going to come right. to that because I think it's actually um, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's one of our grounds, grounds of appeal, so I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that and develop it. Um, what I was then going to do is just deal with our grounds in, in, in turn. The first two grounds of appeal um, concern what we submit were errors of law made by the judge in his approach to the exercise of the cross-class cram-down power. Um, and the first ground concerns what we say was an error by the judge in failing to take into account adequately or, or at all that the objectives of the plan in the present case could have been met by an alternative fairer plan which respected the peri passu ranking of the unsecured debt in the relevant alternative of a liquidation. And um, it's not a fairer plan, if, if I heard you correctly. It's, you say the current plan is not fair, and a fair plan would at least have respected the peri passu rules yes. and some good reason to the car company. Yes. It's not a fairer plan. The objective of the plan could equally have been met by... Yeah. Um, to win, you to have to say, this was an unfair plan. We do say that, in yeah. Local mm. terms. We do. So it's not just, there would have, it, it isn't just, there would have been a, there could have been a fairer one. Yeah. You have to sort of say that there was, this is unfair because there was no justification to the problem. Ex that, that, exactly. So the objective of the plan, let me put it this way, the objective of the plan was to achieve a managed wind down of the group's property portfolio and the distribution of proceeds to creditors, we say that it was equally possible to achieve that through a plan which treated all secured creditors unequally. It did not require the differential treatment of unsecured creditors that the plan imposed. 
the planned company conceded that that was possible and therefore there was no good reason or proper justification for the departure from the Pari Passu and that makes the plan unfair. So that's essentially um, what we, how we put it in, in, in under this ground. Now, in order to try and deal with this point, um, the plan company submitted to the judge that it was not part of the court's role when considering whether or not to exercise the cross-class cram down power, to consider whether the best, whether the plan was the best plan or the only available plan available. And they made that um, submission in reliance on the case law applicable to um, schemes of arrangement, which we've looked at. Um, the judge accepted that submission about the limited nature of the court's role. And we say he was wrong to do so, um, and that that case law can't simply be transplanted across as supplying the answer where the court's been asked to exercise the cross-class cram down power. Now, um, if I can just show you firstly where the judge dealt with this in the judgment, um, tab five, paragraph 75, at page 784. Um, and what the judge said at paragraph 75 was he refers to my learned friend's um, submission that there's important difference between claims to set aside CVA for unfair prejudice and an application to sanction restructure plan, and that it was not the court's role to consider whether the plan was the best plan or the only fair scheme which is available. And then in support of that proposition, um, they relied on something uh, that Sir Asda Norris had said in the amicus finance case. Um, and then 76, um, we accepted that approach was correct for schemes of arrangements submitted. It was not the correct approach for restructuring plans under Part 26A, where there was a dissenting class. And we'll come, we referred to New Look, which we'll come back to. And then 77, first sentence, the judge um, accepted Mr. Bayfield's submission, rejected Mr. Smith's submission on this issue. Um, and if you go on in the judgment, this point then comes back by the time you get to 302, subparagraph 6. And in the first sentence of paragraph 6, um, and this is clearly referring back to what's gone before, um, I accept Mr. Bayfield's submission as, as a matter of law, I do not have to be satisfied that the plan is the best plan available or that it could not be fairer. Now, we do not say that the court has to be satisfied that the plan is the best plan. But in considering the question of fairness in relation to cross-class cram down, it is part of the court's role to consider what alternatives are or might be available. And in our submission, the judge's approach, to the extent he was shutting out of his mind, looking at alternatives, was erroneous. And he should have accepted our submission that in considering whether the plan was fair, the court is necessarily required to consider whether some different allocation of the assets and benefits would have been possible. Now, the difficulty here is caused by this use of the expression fairer. Yes. Because if you say, would, should the court sanction a plan which it thinks is unfair? Yes. The answer is obviously not. If you say, should the court consider whether the plan could have been fairer, one sort of presupposes that the current plan is fair. Yes. The point is that without sort of actually understanding what you mean by fair or fairer in that yes. context, it's a pretty meaningless inquiry. Well, exactly, and that's not, and it, that's not really how we put the submission. And I mean, and It's not really what Mr Justice David Richards was talking about in Telewest, in, in what we, which we looked at. Exactly. I mean, it's the unfair way to sort of, sorry, it's unfair. You shouldn't. He really wasn't. That's not the point he was addressing. I don't think in telling West. Exactly. Right. And and it's not our submissions, and it nor was it our submission before the judge to say the judge has to be satisfied that the plan is the best plan or the fairest plan. What we say, however, is that when considering whether to exercise cross-class cram down, 
the court has as part of that exercise to consider whether some different allocation of assets and benefits would have been possible, which would have achieved the objectives of the plan. And therefore, if that's not been followed, ask itself the question whether that makes the, the plan unfair. Let me put it this way. If, if, if you could achieve the objectives of the plan by treating us in a way which respects the paying passive agreement, that's something the court in our submission must take into account, and at least potentially renders this plan unfair by treating us in a non pay passive way for no good reason or justification. Can, can you just just help me on yes. this in terms of context? Are we are these arguments under ground one and perhaps ground two directed to the um, question of whether the nine oh one F power ought to be exercised. Yes. Correct. They're not, they're not directed to Condition A. No, correct. And what is the position about Condition A? Well, Condition A is our seventh ground of appeal, so we don't, we don't accept that the judge's um, conclusions were right on the, the no worse off test. But that, in that case... But, but your, I mean, as I understand, your, isn't your case in part, is it, is that you were worse off because of the non-application of the para-passive principle as a feature of the scheme. Um, as opposed to the relevant alternative. Yes, which, well, no, which would have been that you would have had a para-passive treatment under a liquidation. Yes, in that sense, we do, because in, in a sense that the plan departs from para-passive, we say that puts us worse off in the sense that in the relevant alternative we would have shared equally with the um, the other creditors, whereas under the plan we go to the back of the queue. So that, that is part of our, um, obviously, the crux of our argument on discretion. What we don't say as part of these grounds, which are dealing with discretion, is that Condition A specifically wasn't met. Right. Because Condition right. A is looking at the actual money sums you receive in the different scenarios. So if you get an unequal distribution, but you get 80p in the pound, you're yes. better off than if you get an equal distribution, but only 60p in the pound. Um, well, if that was the if, if that was the outcome, but obviously the whole point of the departure from the non pari passive is that it puts us at the risk of the assets not being sufficient. That's a different but, point. Well, yeah, but, yeah, but, but that's I think the point I'm engaged on at the moment on these grounds. I, I think your answer to uh, my lord um, Nicholas Patton is that um, the no worse off test in condition A is directed at the money yes. question rather than the conceptual question. So the, the condition A is, 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 a, is a money question. It is. You, you can't argue that you're worse off because you're not treated pari passu for condition A purposes if the plan gave you, as my Lord, Lord Justice Nugis indicated, a much better financial outcome. Exactly. What you're saying is this horizontal comparator question, how you allocate the restructuring surplus, which has enabled condition A to be satisfied, comes in on the exercise of discretion. Exactly. Yes, yeah, so to be clear, when I um, described earlier there's three stages to the cross-class creme down test, the condition A satisfied, condition B satisfied, and then discretion. Grounds one to six are all concerned with discretion. Ground seven is concerned with, yeah. the, as my Lord Lord Justice Stone puts it, the money question, which is the no worse off test. But the fact that everybody may be better off in money terms as a result of the plan yes. is the, the base equation that you have to satisfy even to get you through condition A. Exactly. But it doesn't answer the question, is it appropriate to exercise the power of cross-class cram down? Because that's all about how you divide up the benefits of the restructuring. That's exactly the point. So, I mean, put it another way, I mean, the, the first six grounds of appeal proceed on the assumption that condition A is, is satisfied on the money question. They're concerned with the third stage of the, the analysis. I mean, the, 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 just the presupposition of all this stuff is that nobody actually wants to pull the trigger and put everybody into position where everybody yes. is worse off, even though people threaten it yes. for negotiating purposes. Yes. 
the truth is nobody actually wants to be in that position. Yeah. That's not what this is about. This is about forcing some creditors to accept a deal that they're not happy with um, at, on the instigation of creditors who are happy with the deal. Yeah. And you say in order to in order to mm-hmm. test that you have to have a you have to look across the piece, not just say, well you're all better off, stop whinging. Yes. That is exactly Basically. the point. It's about put it another way, it's about the fair distribution of the surplus created by the plan. Or, or put it the other way around, it's about the fair distribution of the risk inherent in the plan, two sides of the same coin. Can I, can I ask you, yes. at, at some stage, if you could show us the evidence as to what quantum of restructuring surplus the judge was working on? What quantum of restructuring surplus? Um, yes, I can. I mean, it depends a little bit on which um, figures you take for the relevant alternative, and whether you take the judge's alternative enforcement scenario. But yes, we've, we've got that evidence we can show you. Um, you can I mean, on the, on the choice between the experts, the judge came down in favour of Mr Bayfield's experts. And, and so we've got the comparator analysis. Well, And, and that has a figure, yes. I don't have it in my head, for how much restructuring surplus would be thrown up by, by the plan. Yes. And so we can show, taking the plan company's figures, we can, you get it from the BCG report, yes. we can show you the, the, the difference between the, the plan, plan outcome. It's partly insolvency, it's mostly insolvency exactly. discount, but there's also the costs of administration. Exactly. And, exactly. And I don't have them. We'll give you a look, look those references, and you've got them. In, they're in the BCG report. Um, now, so, so as we say, I mean, it, 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 to be clear, it's not a question about being satisfied that the plan is the, um, is the best or the fairest, but it's a question of looking at the allocation of benefits under the plan, asking yourself whether that allocation is unfair, and for those purposes you have to look, we submit, at what alternatives are possible that would achieve the same objectives as the plan is setting out to achieve. Now, um, so far as the law is concerned, there's three principal points we'd make. Um, The first is the point I've already made, that to the extent the judge was um, simply applying um, principles from scheme of arrangements, and it appears that he may have been because um, your lordship has noticed he picks up specifically the language that was used by Mr. Justice David Richards in paragraph 22 of Telewares. Then, in our submission, that was wrong, and one can't simply transplant those principles um, across. I mean, to be clear, what you say is Sir Alistair Norris was wrong. Yes. In the extract that appears in paragraph 75, um, at least as I would understand it, you at least say he went wrong um, in the last seven lines. That's exactly right, and in fact, I mean, those are the lines I've um, I've highlighted. That's, exactly, I mean, that's going to be my second point. We we submit that 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 um, part of Amicus Finance is wrong. Um, just going back to my first point before we come to Amicus, um, I mean, to, if what the judge was doing was in effect transplanting that statement from Mr. Justice David Richards in Telewest and applying that over to the question of cross class cram down under Part 26A, well, we submit that they, that principle can't simply be transplanted in that way and that it doesn't provide a complete answer to the inquiry which the court has to undertake under cross-class cram-down. And the reason is that where the court's been asked to exercise cross-class cram-down, by definition, the plan will not have been approved by one or more dissenting classes. Indeed, in theory, you could have a number of dissenting classes, all of whom are unanimously against the plan. So what you can't do, we submit, is simply rely on and defer to the votes of the meeting in the same way that one can a scheme and apply a relatively light touch test at sanction. But by, by definition, the power of, san- of cram down allows you to deviate from the exactly. wishes of one of the classes. In, indeed, and the whole, in, in, in indeed, the whole, the whole scenario of cross class cram down is you do have competing views because the way, and this is reflected in the terminology used in the legislation, you've got one or more classes that have approved 
the plan by the relevant majority, and they um, may be termed the assenting classes. You've also got one or more dissenting classes, to use the terminology of the legislation. So what the court is more engaged in in that context is having to form a judgment on the competing views between different classes who've expressed different views. But, I mean, why doesn't that just simply require the judge to take into account that in a particular class or classes, they haven't had the 75% approval. Uh, it's, a, it's a lesser uh, number of creditors. And that's a factor to be weighed into the balance. So you can't simply say with a sort of yes. stroke of a pen, oh, well, everybody's approved this by some huge majority, and therefore the creditors know what, what's best for them. But I don't at the moment see why that actually, the fact that there is a dissenting minority, uh, why that informs the question objectively of whether or not the scheme is fair. I mean, the question of whether the scheme is fair doesn't depend on whether or not an individual creditor objected to it or not, because the judge won't know why they, very often, why they objected yeah. to it. I mean, the judge is still going to have to look at the scheme and say, is it fair? And I don't see in that context why it's irrelevant or wrong necessarily in principle to say, well, it doesn't have to be the only fair scheme or the best scheme. I mean, one's into the precisely the same inquiry as you would be on a, on a conventional scheme application. Yes, I mean, and to be clear, we don't say the test is that the court has to be satisfied that the, the plan has to be the best or fairest plan. All I'm saying is that when you come to the stage of exiling cross-class cram down, and by definition, the court is having to come to a judgment between the views of the one or more assenting class and one or more dissenting class, one of the things that the court should take into account is the question of whether some different allocation of benefits might be possible and whether that different allocation would meet the same objective and whether in those circumstances what's proposed by the assenting creditors is unfair vis-a-vis -vis the dissenting. That's all I'm saying. Now, I mean, it, it, it might, I mean it, certainly in, in my experience, the court wouldn't necessarily engage in that sort of exercise on scheme of arrangement because typically when you get to the sanction hearing, if everyone's voted in favour, um, the court will defer to the views of the meeting of creditors and uh, my Lord's observed earlier, there isn't in fact an example one can find in the authorities of the court declining to sanction the scheme on pure fairness grounds. In the restructuring plan, it's rather different because you've got, by definition, you've got a competition, a difference in view between an assenting class and a dissenting but, class. Uh, it's, not, it's not just that. If I can go back to the point that the Patton's just made. Um, in a scheme, you have, by definition, every class has consented by the requisite majorities. Yeah. Within a class, people are voting within a class because the court has earlier taken the view that they can all consult together with a view to their common interest. Their rights are not so dissimilar. And so in that circumstance, the court says, well, rather than second-guessing the views of creditors, which I can't know and can't discover, Yes. All other things being equal, I will defer to the view of the majority of the class of similarly positioned people who were put in the class because they can consult together with a view to the common interest, because I can't start inquiring into why they, some voted in favour and some voted against. You just go with the majority. Yes. In a plan, you have put people into different classes because they cannot consult together with a view to their common interest. So you start from the proposition that they do not have a commonality of interest and one group has said no and the other group has said yes. And the question is inevitably, therefore, isn't it, you have to compare the treatment of the different classes. And you can't just say, well, because a majority voted either against or by a majority but not the statutory majority, that I can just defer to the views of that group. Yes, I mean that's exactly what we that's exactly what we say that's precisely, um, and they obviously are very different. And putting it in, and putting it a different way, in the scheme context where you've got the votes of all the different classes with the different 
in, with the different rights, who've all approved it by the majority, it makes sense for the court effectively to apply a rationality approach and simply sort of double check, well, does, does the view that they've come to make sense? If it, if it does, I'm not going to defer from the fact that in each of those different meetings, the creditors have approved it by the majority. In the restructuring plan, you're, the court's got a different function. It effectively has to adjudicate, in a sense, between the assenting class and the dissenting class. And it therefore does need to form a view on whether the plan is unfair, which in our submission does involve looking at what the alternatives might be. So, um, I mean, that's our, our sort of fundamental objection um, to the way the judge approached it. I mean, the, in terms of case law, um, we do rely on what was said by my Lord Justice Snowden in Virgin Active, um, which is in the authorities bundle. Hopefully, your Lordship will have this in divider two at tab 28. Um, and it begins at page 857. Now, um, Virgin Active was a cross-class um, cram-down case. Um, it was also a case, however, where the dissenting creditors were all found to be out of the money. So it's therefore um, a different set of facts because the dissenting creditors were out of the money. And one of the, the principal findings in the case is that where you have dissenting creditors who are out of the money, it's essentially um, little or no way to skim to their views in, in, in any event. So that point um, is a point of distinction. But if we go to 255 to 256, um, my Lord does comment on what the position would have been um, if the dissenting creditors in that case, had been in the money in the relevant alternative. And that this, this is picked up at 255, um, where my Lord says, um, Mr. Dicker's QC's example would have been more relevant if there'd been no secured creditors, and the battle on sanctions being between the A-lease landlords, as the assenting class, and the remaining classes of B-to-E lease landlords and general property creditors as the dissenting class, classes, and that each of those classes would have been in the money in the relevant alternative. So this is dealing with the hypothesis that, in fact, the dissenters were in the money. Um, in such a situation, the court might well have to look closely at whether the proposed compromise with the assenting class was a real compromise or arrangement of those rights or a manipulation of the classes. And it would also have to look closely at whether the dissenting class received a share of the enterprise that was preserved by the plan that was in some way proportionate or compromised to the compar to the, comparable to the compromise they were being asked to make. That is, that is not, however, the instant case. So it does require consideration of the alternatives. Now, um, the language used there is share of the value of the enterprise. One might substitute for that share of the restructuring surplus. But clearly, where you're dealing with, um, in effect, a dispute between the assenting class and the dissenting class, both of whom are in the money, which is our case, you do have to look at the alternatives. And then 256, um, my Lord said this, the analysis that I've set out above appears to be, be consistent with the views expressed by Professor Mo Carl in, those, in his two articles in the Butterworth Journal of International Banking and Financial Law. Um, in the January 2021 article, after identifying the concept of restructuring surplus, Professor Mo Carl suggests that the fundamental but not only purpose of judicial discretion as to whether to approve a cram down is to assess whether the proportion of the restructuring surplus allocated to its dissenting class is just and equitable, or in the language of Chapter 11 of the US Bankruptcy Code, fair and equitable. And then, um, as is pointed out in 257, that principle of allocation of the restructuring surplus is only applicable as between creditors who have a genuine economic interest in the company. But that, that's our case, the present case. And then he goes on um, to explain that, and then 258 um, explains how one goes about looking whether the share of the restructuring surplus is a, 
uh, allocation. So in our submission, that supports our view. I mean, we submit that's an entirely correct, but it supports our submission that where you're dealing with a competition between an assenting class and a dissenting class, both of whom are in the money and the relevant alternative, um, you do have to look at the question of whether some alternative allocation of benefits, or to use the other side of the coin, allocation of risks, um, would be possible. So that's our, our first point. The second point is that we do, with respect, um, submit that the dicta of Sir Alistair Norris in Amicus Finance, which was relied on by the judge, um, are wrong. Um, Amicus Finance, um, the Lordships, I think, will have in the Properties Bundle 3 behind Divider 31. Um, and it begins at page 985. And as your Lordship have seen, the judge relied quite heavily on this in paragraph 75 and 77 of the judgment. Um, this was a restructuring plan case under part 26A, where um, cross-class cram down was relied on in order to sanction the plan. Um, as you can see from four lines down, in the head note, um, one of the five class meetings did not approve the plan, so there was a dissenting class to use the language of the legislation. Um, the principal dispute was whether the no worse off test, condition A in section 901G, was satisfied. Um, the court held that it was and sanctioned the plan. Um, but the respondent and the judge also relied on what. Um, Sir Alistair Norris said at paragraph 45 of the judgment, which is page 997. And you can see from the, um, the opening part of paragraph 45, he's, he's dealing here with um, a fairness or discretion point rather than the point going to the satisfaction no worse off test of condition A. Um, it says there's one submission of counsel for crowd stacker that I must specifically address. Council submitted that the scheme failed the fairness test purely and simply because none of the benefits, if any from future trading, accrued to the compromised creditors and the benefits accrued solely to the shareholders. So it's effectively a complaint about the distribution of benefits saying, well, the compromised creditors don't get the benefits from future trading. That goes instead to the, the shareholders and that's unfair. Um, and the judge um, dismisses that, but he dismisses it by reference to scheme of arrangement case law. Um, he re refers um, firstly to the, the Provident case, but then um, specifically to those paragraphs from Telly West, um, which I showed your lordships earlier in the judgment of my lord um, in Sunbird. Um, and he says this underneath G, the context is an entirely straightforward commercial one in which he did very well establish that it's not the role of the court to consider whether the scheme submitted for sanction is the best scheme or the only scheme or could be improved in some respect, but rather to assure itself that it's one approved by the requisite majority of properly informed and consulting creditors acting in accordance with their ordinary class interests and not oppressively in pursuance of some special interest. C. Re. Telly West, paragraphs 21 to 22. Now, in our submission, that makes sense and is self-evidently correct in the context of a Part 26 scheme. Um, in our submission, it doesn't make sense, certainly doesn't supply the answer, where the court's faced with a question um, of cross-class cram down of Part 26 a, where there is a dissenting class. Um, the question that is put before the court is whether the allocation of benefits under the plan is fair. I think maybe uh, I'm just wondering whether actually we're being, so I was previously, or you are being unfair in suggesting yeah. that Sir Alison Norris, who's an experienced judge in this area, was wrong. Um, in this case, in amicus finance, you've got a series of assenting classes and one dissenting class. Um, um, but is five the, class, well, five class meetings and one dissenting class. Right. Yes. So far as this complaint by the dissenting class, 
Um, they're just saying none of the benefits from future trading go to the compromised creditors. All the classes were compromised, weren't they? Um, yes. So actually, in a sense, therefore, there is no difference between, there's no material difference in the treatment between the creditor classes insofar as this objection. No, but I think the objection, well, if you go to the second sentence of paragraph 45, I think the objection was that the, the benefits from future trading went to the shareholders. Yes, so that, yeah. so that what Sir Alistair is saying there is, look, you've got a series of dissenting classes. They're all compromised. Yeah. They all take a haircut, to use the wording phraseology I used earlier. Yes. Four of them say, look, it's OK. We, yeah. just, we take a haircut. Um, and yes, all right, if the plan works, the ultimate benefit goes to the shareholders who retains the benefit of some equity in yes. the surviving company. The one dissenting class says, we don't think that's, quote, fair. Yes. But there's no difference between the classes in that respect. <coughs> the difference between the classes is probably something, some other reason. And so what Sir Alistair is saying is, look, four, four rational groups of creditors think it's OK to take a haircut on that basis. Why should the court listen to the one which, in this respect, doesn't ha have any difference? It's well, treated in the same way. So is the horizontal comparator really at issue on this particular point as between the classes? I wonder whether that's the explanation for what he was driving at. It could be. I mean, I see that. It doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, that, that doesn't leap out at one from the, that, that paragraph. But, but if, if it is, I mean, let's assume, for sake of argument, that is the correct explanation. It doesn't really support the judge's approach and reliance on it in this case. No, no, no. But yeah. I, I understand you're saying yeah. this case is different because on this case, your clients are in a different class yeah. than the others, and that's what they're complaining about, the allocation of the surplus. But I wonder whether Sir Alistair is really dealing with a different case, well, where all the classes, as far as shareholders are concerned, are the same. And he's then saying, well, you know, rationally, four classes in favour, one class against. I should cram down. It was the, I think it was the example I gave to you a little earlier of potentially the court saying, well, if four similarly positioned classes think it's, it's, it's a fair quid pro quo and they are treated the same as a dissenting yes. class in this respect, the court might say, well, you know, that's just well, a rational basis for doing it. I mean, uh, Yes, I mean, I see that. And obviously, for my purposes, that reading of, of Amicus is, is sufficient. Well, perhaps you can have a look at the facts to see whether, it, whether it's, it's, it, that is right. Um, well, the, the, I'm, I'm sure it's right that the, the five classes of creditors were all compromised, because I think the, I mean, what, what is the complaint that was made is exactly that that's summarised in the second sentence of paragraph 45. I mean, you see it. It's essentially complaining about the treatment of the shareholders vis-a-vis -vis the compromised creditors. It doesn't seem to be suggested, for example, that one class is being differentially compromised in order to provide a benefit to no. shareholders, which, um, for example, was the case in Virgin Active, I think. In Virgin Active, I faced an allegation that the landlords as a class were being disadvantaged yes. in order to provide yes. benefit or in circumstances where the shareholders were allowed, being allowed to continue to benefit. Exactly, and okay. so I mean, I, I mean, one, one can therefore make two submissions about that. I mean, if one reads it in the way in which um, my, my lord has explained, then it, it doesn't provide any support for the, in effect, the wider proposition which the judge um, drew from it, um, which is that looked at more generally, where you are dealing with a um, discrimination between creditors. I'm I'm very sorry, Mr. Smith. Um, I hope nobody minds, but I'm going to suggest we rise a bit early. Of course, my lord. For purely personal reasons, and we'll start again, if we say, at quarter to two. I'm grateful, my lord. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.